guys came to this event today. This is um, a presentation sponsored by the Student Activities Board and the Marketing Club. Um, you're going to learn some valuable information, maybe some things that you already knew, but are going to be able to be applied um, beyond your experience in college. So briefly, I want to introduce our speaker, uh, Rochelle Smith, principal uh, and founder of Positive Creative Infusion Consulting LLC is an entrepreneur, professional speaker, and author, and is based in suburban Detroit, Michigan. Her greatest passion in life is challenging, inspiring, and motivating companies, organizations, and individuals to be the best they can be, and to reach unparalleled success and happiness. An avid writer, she is the author of several books. She started her corporate career in marketing in the Betty Crocker Division of General Mills in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She then became a multi-million dollar sales producer with other Fortune 500 companies in her sales role in the pharmaceutical biotechnology industries in Detroit, Michigan. She graduated from Louisiana State University in Shreveport with a bachelor's in mass communication and public relations. While at LSUS, she, she, she held several leadership roles. She went on to earn a master's from Florida International University in Miami and a second master's from Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. <clears throat> During her college tenure, she was inducted into four honor societies, academics, leadership, foreign languages, and journalism and mass communication. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker and proud 1998 LSUS alum, Rochelle Smith. It is such an honor to be back on campus. I'm always so excited. Actually, my parents still live in the area, so I'm actually in town quite a bit. So it is certainly an opportunity that I'm very excited about, and it's something I never take lightly. The opportunity to come back and speak to one of my alma maters, LSUS, being one of my favorite alma maters. And so it's great to be back and speak to you all, and encourage and inspire and motivate you all to reach for success as you move forward in the workplace. We got a pretty ambitious agenda this morning. Make sure you won't get out on time, I promise. Like many of you have classes starting at noon. So we're going to talk a little bit, talk a little bit about the generational divide. We're going to talk about personal branding, talk about the importance of leadership, and, and six minutes of success. We've got a lot of material to cover, so it's going to be quite a ride for you this morning. And I will take time at the end for questions. So feel free to give your questions. You can raise your hand at the end, and I will entertain your questions then. But we want to start out this morning. I always like to start out with a story, and actually want to start out with a story that defines, well actually it's one of my defining moments as a student here at LSUS. As you heard, I graduated in 1998. I want to start out with a quick story that highlights the example of the power of belief. So, we have any Golden Girls, anybody remember that show? You guys are catching reruns, it's not kind of young, but I was around when it was the original show, and it was awesome. But for those of you who are actually familiar with that show, you know, remember Sophia Petrillo, Dorothy's mother, whenever she shared a story, she would start out with, picture it, right? Sicily, 1937. Picture it, Sicily, 1942, whatever the case may be. So what I want you all to do is picture it. It's a hot summer day. Lord knows it gets so hot here in Louisiana. I'm glad I live in Michigan now. But picture it, it's a hot summer day in 1995. And I am in my public speaking class, Communications 135, taking it with Dr. Charlene Hanford Barlow, who has since retired. Now, I was giving my third speech, which is a speech to motivate. Now, keep in mind, I'm a motivational speaker now. Giving this impassioned speech to persuade, speech to persuade and to motivate, and roughly 10 minutes into my presentation, I blanked out. So I'm standing there, mortified, do I do? Felt so embarrassed. Is there anybody in the house that can relate to that? You're giving a presentation, I see some hands going up. So you can relate to that. So what makes that a defining moment, everyone, is because I had two options. I had a decision to make at that moment. I could either, one, sit down, which is what I wanted to do, just throw in the towel, it's done, I've already made a mistake, it's over. Or, number two, I could keep going. And there's something that Dr. Hanford said to me during that pivotal moment. She said, Michelle, keep going. Where I wanted to sit down, she encouraged me to keep going. So I always like to start out by talking to college students because you've got to realize your professors, everyone around you, you may be tired, many of you have a lot of jobs, you have classes, you may want to give up, but you've got to keep going. And I think about the fact now that I'm a motivational speaker, a professional speaker, imagine if I had given up. I wouldn't be standing here before you today. So be encouraged as we go through this presentation about the power of belief. And incidentally, that's actually a picture of Dr. Hanford 
Barlow and I back in 1998 before I graduated. We're going to start this morning looking at the workplace. We know a lot of things have changed, even since I was a student here at LSU. Much has changed in the workplace. Okay? We have a big paradigm shift in terms of, okay, back in the day, the classified ads is where you found your jobs. That's where we used to look. Oh, let me see the Shreveport Times. Who's hiring? I was a public relations major. All right? But now you've got technology. You've got the internet. So for any one position, you can literally have, depending on where the job is, thousands of people applying for the same job. Okay? So technology has really changed things and what companies are doing and what they're looking for and how they're evaluating applicants. So there's varying applicants for any one position. So keep that in mind. But one thing that's absolutely huge, will give you a huge advantage, we'll talk more about that, is differentiation. What makes you unique? We're going to talk more about personal branding and why that matters and how you can differentiate yourself. The, the point at the bottom here towards the end, limited resources, opportunities in the workplace, that's always been the case. There's never enough promotions. There's never enough money to give raises. There's always budgetary challenges. So that's always existed, but I would say now it's much more so of an issue because you have so many more people coming into that pipeline in the workplace. Lastly, decreased loyalty. All right, 30, 40 years ago, it was cool to stay with a company for 40 years, 30 years, retire. I live in Detroit. I actually know people who have spent 35, 40 years with, a, with one of the big three automobile companies, GM, Chrysler, Ford. That, these days, I'm sure many of you would think of that and say, there's no way I want to stay with a company that long. So not only employees not as loyal as they used to be, but also employers and companies are not as loyal in terms of keeping employees and, and wanting them to stay around that long uh, certainly doesn't exist anymore. So now we're going to look at the generational divide, the generational overview. OK, so anytime we have people with different backgrounds, there's going to be opportunities for conflict and for challenge. And that's what's happening in the workplace now. You have four generations. You've got baby boomers. You've got Generation X. You've got Generation Y, millennials. Then you've got generation, the Generation Z coming behind you. And so what does that mean? You've got different perspectives, values, expectations. And that creates, a lot of times, some tension in the workplace. You have a baby boomer who will look at millennial and say, you don't know what it means to sacrifice. I have to do this. I have to do that to get this job. And you're taking everything for granted. You know, there's always kind of this dichotomy that exists. Well, one thing I always emphasize is we've got to learn to embrace those who are different from us. Baby boomers got to see you all and say, we've got fresh energy, we've got fresh talent. We have this passion for enthusiasm, for technology, and all these new things that are developing and coming about. And so smart companies realize that all of these differences, generationally included, are a source of organizational strength. All right, so it's great to have members of four generations. It's, you know, some companies have only millennials and they're kind of leaving out the generation Xers and baby boomers. But it's great for companies to have all three. And you millennials are an excellent, excellent addition to the workforce. We'll talk more about that. And so with the teamwork and collaboration piece, smart companies are realizing, hey, how can we teach everyone to get along? How can we create shared understanding so that when you all come in, you're not met with this resistance of, oh, these people think they know it all, oh, they're entitled. Well, that's not the case, all right? These stereotypes that are out there are not, not true, all right? So we're going to talk about ways to differentiate yourself. First off, baby boomers, all right? My dad's generation, folks born between 1946 and 64. The 2010 census says 40.3 million of those folks, all right? You can see from the graph here, if you look at 1990, we can see how that group is exponentially growing. We look at by 2050, where it's going to be. So rapidly growing group, rapidly growing group. Baby boomers are very, very important. My generation, but I'm happy to say towards the end, so I'm actually younger. And so um, I'm at Generation X there. We look at my generation. We say, with this particular graphic, and I love how employer branding today pointed out and created this to say, essentially, what benefit do Generation Xers bring more so than Generation Ys or Millennials than baby boomers? We can see that 50% experience. All right, that's one of the things we bring to the table, one of the greatest things we bring to the table. Number two, emotional maturity. Number three, motivation if given career development opportunities. So again, perhaps the baby boomer would want to stay in the same job for 30 years, and I've seen that happen a lot in Detroit. Not change, keep that same job, no, more, no moving, 
know, transferring. You can say my generation, we wanted to start moving around, but it's really true for you all. We're going to talk more about that. Now, this is you all, Generation Y. I'm sure many of you can relate to this. Guardian.com actually published an awesome article last week that says, hey, you guys are interested in more than just money. Money is important, yes, yeah, you want to make a living, but at the end of the day, your job is not just a means to pay the rent. You want to pursue your passions, your philosophies, your hobbies. You're concerned about making a difference in the world. All right? So we know that many of the baby boomers, and again, this is not to stereotype everyone, but stability, security is very important, taking care of your family. That's why that keeping the job for 30, 40 years was, was, was very common. But now, what we see with the millennials, who keep a job, I've actually seen some millennials get a job three weeks, not working for me, I don't know. You go find something else. All right? So research shows, generation-wide, when we're talking about this, you all are more likely to become entrepreneurs. And we think about the generational divide where previous generations was all about stability, security, need to retirement, want everything to be predictable. With your generation, it's all about risk. You're comfortable with taking risks and saying, I'm willing to start my own business, I'm willing to leave this job after three weeks if it's not working for me. Continuing on, let's take a look at this Pew Research Center report from 2010. 60% of younger workers say it's not very likely or not likely at all that they will stay in their current, stay with their current employers for the remainder of their working life. All right, whereas my generation, X, say 62% say, hey, it's less likely that they'll never leave their current employer. Take a look at this. 84% of baby boomers expect to remain with their current employer for the rest of their working life. So see, you all are all about change, and we're going to talk more about that. Take a look at the second point. Only one-third of millennials, you all say that their current job is their career. I think this is so important. Because again, in previous generations, you get that job, it's a great job, you stay in that career. And I want to speak some career topics. So I'm speaking to baby boomers, I'm speaking to Generation X as well. And they're thinking, change jobs, change careers. I've been a lawyer for 20 years. For you all, law school's been great, it's been wonderful. Let me find something else that I'm more passionate about. So you can see the differences there. Take a look at this graphic from atkearney.com. You can see millennials will comprise the majority of the workforce by 2025. You all are growing rapidly. And the baby boomers are starting to retire, we saw that. 10,000 people per day in this country are turning 65 or older. But you can see, Generation Y, it's all about the millennials moving forward. You all are going to be running the show very soon. Get excited. This is another graphic. By 2030, millennials will outnumber baby boomers by 22 million. When I'm speaking to baby boomers, I'm telling them, don't be threatened. The millennials are bringing a lot to the table. I'm seeing some, some baby boomers and some generation that's are smiling. They're thinking, these young people are coming in and they're taking all of our jobs. All right, but a lot of you guys are coming in, you're going to be running the show soon, but there's something we as Generation Xers, as well as baby boomers, should get excited about. There's a lot that you all are bringing. Let's take a look at this graphic, which is similar to the one before. What benefits do you all bring to the workforce as opposed to Generation X or baby boomers? Okay, we can see that 50% over there to the left. Productivity due to being tech savvy. You all have an absolute, just innate passion for technology, web, all of that. Where we Generation Xers are like, can I read the classifieds? You know, you all are like, what is that? We can see here, we got a tie for second, global mindedness. With technology and the internet, we now see that Shreveport, we would see, okay, back in the day, Shreveport, Louisiana, Northwest Louisiana, but now you're thinking globally. What's going on in France? You can read the paper. You can Skype your friend in Bahrain if you want to. So there's so many opportunities because of this internet that's allowing you all to become global players from right here in Shreveport, all right? Tie your second networking potential. And I love that talk, 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 but there are those of us who talk, talk, talk in any generation. But you all are all about building relationships. You're all about making connections. We're gonna talk about the importance of that as it relates to networking to your career. But I love this, the fourth place, I'll just mention this quickly, you all are open. That is a huge advantage. We think about baby boomers. Think about Generation Xers. We may have a tendency to say, this is how it's always been done. Why are we changing it? This has been our process. You know, the, the process or the concept of change may be a little threatening to us. But you all are cool. You know, this is great. Somebody who's been at this company 30 years, one of you all comes in the door and says, hey, let's try it this way. That's powerful. That's absolutely powerful. 
Now we're going to talk a little bit about passion, talent, and purpose. Because we know for the millennial generation, this is absolutely important. And I love, love that you all get this so young. I love what Vincent Van Gogh had to say. I would rather die of passion than boredom. Because guess what? You have to love what you do. And this is the thing I absolutely love most about the millennial generation. You all get it. Because when I'm speaking to baby boomers, Generation X, I'm a Generation X myself, and I, don't, I can't say that it, when I was a student at LSUS, I had the mindset of, I've got to think about what am I passionate about? How can I be with my life purpose? How can I do that? Now I figure that now, at age 37, I understand that, but for you all to understand this early in the game is absolutely phenomenal. Because guess what? It happens every day. You meet people that have been working 40 years, and they absolutely hate what they do. So let me encourage you. Please have that mindset. I'm sure you probably have it already, but in case you don't, you've got to be passionate for what you do. You've got to wake up in the morning loving going to work, loving your job. This passion is so important. Because in the workplace, you're going to face downsizing. You're going to face competitive coworkers that try to sabotage you. Sometimes you'll have some good times and some bad times, but you've got to be passionate about what you do. So important. Next, talents and gifts. Got to ask yourself, what are you good at? Okay, what do you love doing? Thirdly, your generation gets this. If money were no object, what would you pursue? Because in previous generations, it's all about what's going to pay most. How am I going to get the best title? When I was a student here and left and I went to graduate school and then went to a fast graduate program, for me, when I left Northwestern, it was all about how can I get a job with a big name company? General Mills, marketing company, you know, in Minneapolis. It wasn't necessarily, how can I be the most happy? Am I going to be just wake up every day on fire to do this? That wasn't what it was all about. Many of my classmates felt the same way. And guess what? Roughly half of us are entrepreneurs now. So what does that tell you? We ultimately had to shift out and find our, our purpose, talents, purpose, talents, and passion. But God, the money will come. We've heard that. Do what you love, and the money will come. Now, in terms of discovering your talents, gifts, Again, the Career Services Office, they can help you with that. There's assessments, there's tests, online, offline, all of that. There's different ways where you can figure out what are you good at, what are your gifts. I'm telling you folks, that is so, so, so important. Because you spend time, you meet people, they hate what they do every day. They hate their jobs, they hate their careers. They get to the end of their life and they're 80 years old saying, I wish I had done this, I wish I had done that. And I'm speaking to them, trying to cheer them up and motivate them to make a positive change. So get this lesson early. Family members, friends, coworkers, or some of you work, there are people that know you. Get clear on this as soon as humanly possible. Purpose is huge. I love this cartoon where you have a gentleman on his deathbed saying, hey, guess what? I finally figured out what I want to do with my life. And it's kind of funny when you think about it, but it's so true. Why are you here? And I think your generation, more than any other generation, gets that. What's your purpose? When I think about my life and what I do, what is my passion? What is my purpose? I'm living that now. All right? I didn't necessarily live that in the corporate world. Perks and all of that stuff was great, but now I wake up in the morning excited, absolutely loving what I do every day. And there's a huge difference, but guess what? But that's because I know what my purpose is. I didn't necessarily know that when I was a student at LSU. So let me encourage you, your purpose is important, and your purpose, our purpose is always bigger than ourselves. Secondarily on purpose, it's never too early. Again, you millennials, you get this. You're thinking about this now. Or too late, as that gentleman who's on his deathbed, all right, to discover your purpose. This whole discovery process, it can take time. It took me several years, all right? And we see, once people kind of get this concept of purpose and how important it is to the workplace and their careers, this is why you see a Fortune 500 CEO retire and take an early buyout and say, you know what, I, I always wanted to teach. I always have just loved students and loved young people, and they go teach. Or the seven-figure seven earning investment banker who decides, <coughs> totally walks away from that career and becomes a missionary. And you're like, what? But that's because that person has found their purpose. And that's when I look about why I the corporate world. It's great, the perks were great, but was I living my purpose? That is so, so, so important. Now we're going to shift gears here into career planning. You notice I use a lot of automotive shift gears. And I love Michigan, so career planning. For you all, it's very important. I think your generation gets this, more so than the two previous. You've got
got to own it. It's up to you. Is it about finding someone else to give you this job and give you that job and make it easy? You've got to own it. It's all up to you. Be proactive. Again, if opportunities come when you create them, you help to create them. Having plan Bs, again, it's kind of funny as I look back now as a 35, 37-year-old woman and say, I had my life all planned out. I was in college and every year was planned out and mapped out. That's great, because I think it helped me achieve some things I wouldn't have otherwise. But life happens. I know the boomers of the generation are shaking their heads like, yes, things happen, things get in the way, so always have a plan B. And much like myself, your career roadmap can be fluid and it can shift over time. All right? When I was here at LSU, when I first came in in 1995, January 1995, I was a Spanish major. I wanted to be a translator. That was my goal, that was my passion. Languages still are, love languages. But as I'm sitting here in a, in a senior level, uh, I tested out with several classes because I take it from in high school. As I'm sitting here translating some literature, and you can probably tell, I'm like a little energizer bunny, so I have a lot of energy, so it's tough for me to stand still and just focus and do that type of work. All right? So I realized then this isn't my future. So I shifted. There's been some shifts in my own career. So I think about my own talents and gifts and where I want to be. Shifted into public relations, which has been beneficial. And actually kind of double major because I had enough hours to double major in Spanish as well. LinkedIn and social media. LinkedIn, folks, is so important. If you're not already on, or if you're not already on LinkedIn, you're talking about your career, taking it to the next level of workplace, it's so important. They've got 200 million folks are online on the website. It's a huge networking tool. But let me encourage you, just a quick word on social media. What you say can hurt you. I'm a member of the HA. You started the stories. I'm a member of the HR Society of Detroit as a professional development expert in training. So I interact with HR people all the time. If you could hear the stories where people are posting something on Facebook, they lose their jobs the next day. They're, they're a viable candidate for a position or a promotion, and they, they penetrate the boss in a Facebook post a couple weeks ago. And actually, a friend of mine, this is kind of sad, a friend of mine actually was saying kind of derogatory things about her workplace and her boss. One of her friends actually printed out the post and faxed it to that boss. So let me encourage you. Everyone who you think is your friend may not necessarily be your friend, especially when you're talking about advancing and moving forward and taking your career to the next level. So please, please, please remember, be careful what you post on all social media. People are watching. People are watching. Now, we talk about social media and how important that is, particularly with LinkedIn and helping to develop your brand, something I'm very passionate about. We talked about that differentiation piece earlier on how you can stand out, how you can be different, particularly as millennials coming into the workforce with these baby boomers and Generation Xers who may be skeptical of what Royal has to offer to brand. Personal branding is key. I know we've got a lot of marketing club members here. Um, I took a marketing class when I was a student as well. Marketing is so important, and that marketing helps to create a point of differentiation for a company, product, service, that's a quick and dirty version, all right? And so, we all know and love LSU, and we think about that. There was a Forbes stated last year, LSU, LSU football is the fourth most valuable college brand in the nation. So when we think about what LSU does to protect that brand, what they've done over the years, in terms of the history of developing that brand, the logo, the mascot, the colors, all of that goes into the brand. And so what I want to tell you is, yes, I do have a background in marketing, General Mills and Betty Crocker and all of that. Companies spend millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to market their brand, to protect their brands. But each and every one of you, as a potential employee, your, your personal brand is just as valuable. So when I speak and I coach and I train people on personal branding and developing their brand, that's how there can be two candidates for one position one person is able to get far more money than another person because their branding is part of that. Ways and things that they do, because whether you're in a competitive job market, um, admissions to colleges and universities are more competitive, you've got to stand out no matter what you're trying to do. Branding is key. So what are some of your personal brand assets, all right? Just like we talk about all those things that go into that LSU brand that makes it the most fourth most valuable brand in college football, these are some of the things that go into your personal brand. Incredibly important. And you can see a lot of these, I mean, your skills, education, strengths, weaknesses, reputation. You can control a lot of these. All right? Perhaps if you're one who works.
works extremely hard and your work ethic is part of your personal brand, again, that's something you can develop. Your personality, your participation, you can work on that. You know, if you don't really like to be around a lot of people, you can work on that. So personal branding is so important. Whenever I'm speaking on personal branding, I actually always typically sing the song by the 1970s group called The Who. Does anybody know that song, Who Are You? Besides the baby boomers, generation Xers, but an awesome song. It basically says, who are you? Who, 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 who? And that's important. I really want to know. Because guess what, folks? If you don't know who you are, and this is a prime time for you to, to discern who you are, what you're bringing to the table. Why are you an employee? Why are you are the employee of choice for any employer? Because if you don't know who you are, how can you differentiate yourself? Incredibly important. There's so many people. I'm telling you, I meet people who are in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they don't have a clue who they are or their value to the marketplace. And I've got to help them to develop a personal branding, and I love doing that. But at your age, you've got prime time now to develop that brand and move it forward as you progress through your career. Because guess what? Self knowledge and awareness is key. Because there's a lot of people, they'll be in the workplace 20 years, and they wonder, why don't I ever get promoted? Why do I always have these same problems in job after job? Because we all have blind spots. So we've got to be aware of our strengths as well as our weaknesses. All right? Our character, all of that goes in. If you've got, if you a person that kind of radiates dishonesty and deception, okay, and you realize you haven't been promoted in your last five jobs, even though you tried, your managers probably have figured out that you're not a person of integrity. So that's critically important that you know who you are. The thing I love about your generation, okay, you all wear this t-shirt with pride. I'm an important person, all right? So with any plethora of choices in any situation, you've got to be able to know, have that personal branding say, I'm valuable, I'm important. When I'm coming to join your company, and I love this about the millennial generation, you get it. You're like, hey, you should be lucky to have me here. I'll leave in two weeks if you don't treat me like I want to be here, if you don't treat me well. Where a baby boomer sitting there saying, in some cases, not all. Oh, I'm so glad to have this job. I don't want to go. All right. So incredibly important that you recognize the value of yourself, what you bring to the market, as well as your personal brand assets. At the end of the day, folks, you're talking about in the workplace, out of the workplace. Do you care? In our job, anytime we're navigating the workplace or the career realm, <coughs> college, whatever the case, do we care? Dale Carnegie says. People are not interested in you. They're not interested in me. They're interested in themselves morning, noon, and after dinner. We can all relate to that. When somebody looks at a group picture, what's the first thing you do? You look for yourself in that picture, right? All right? Leadership expert John Maxwell says, people don't care how much you know until they know you care. All right? And so this is something these, a lot of people stereotype the millennial generation. They'll say, oh, it's all about them, and they don't care about anyone, and they're entitled. But we know that's not true. Yes, there are cases of that, but anytime that's why stereotypes can be ineffective. Because I'm sure there are many of you, not all of you here, really care. Who are really committed about other people and making about the companies that you're joining. All right, so that's why you've got to differentiate yourself to show that you care. Because companies, that's what they want to know. When they're looking to hire people, when bosses are interviewing you, potential bosses, they want to know that you care at the end of the day. Networking. So remember that the strength of your generation is that you all are phenomenal at networking and building relationships. Talking about getting ready for career success, taking your life career to the next level, networking is key. Any baby boomer, Generation X, or millennial will tell you who you still know matters. One thing that I heard growing up, going to LSUS and all of that, who do you know? Who can you connect with? That's still true to this day. Okay? And so it's important for us to communicate. We talked about that personal brand, why you're different. Why should you be hired? Why should you be given the opportunity? Why you're networking, you've got to be able to very, very important. Something I'm very passionate about, and actually published a book last fall on entrepreneurship called Monetizing Your Passion. You have what it takes. Remember, your generation is the most entrepreneurial in history. You all will start a business without even thinking. And so I love to speak on entrepreneurship. And even looking back, even when I was at LSUS, it still didn't occur to me, don't go work for someone else. Start your own business. I didn't even have that mindset where the millennials, you all have more of a mindset. It's more common now. But this is my favorite quote from the book, and I always, when I speak on entrepreneurship, quote this. Build your own dreams, or someone else will hire you to build theirs. 
Now, I get different reactions based on kind of when I say that. Some of the baby boomers will look at me or come to me afterwards and say, I never knew that I could have started my own business right out of college or whatever. I've been working 35 years with someone else. A millennial will say, they'll often cheer and say, absolutely right. I will not have it any other way. I want to build my own dreams. I don't care about making somebody else rich. It's all about, you know, monetize my own passion. But when we think about entrepreneurship, and this is something I'm going to bring a dose of reality to the situation. All right, I often ask this question. So the big question is, if you think about starting your own business, it's just a question. Do you want freedom or do you want security? Because if you want the freedom of being your own boss, you're going to have to be willing to sacrifice the security, particularly as you're starting your business and getting it off the ground, of that paycheck every week or every two weeks or every month. Some people, they're okay with that. Or do you want the security? Hey, I need to have that money, and if I'm willing to have that security of getting that check every week or whenever, then I'm willing to go work for someone else. So everyone is different. You've got to ask yourself that question. Because there are some people who jump off in the business and they start their own business, and they're like, oh my God, how am I going to pay the rent next week? How am I going to pay my mortgage? So you've got to be able to ask, ask yourself that question. Only you know that. Um, entrepreneurship, I think in many cases, it's kind of the end thing, and it's cool, and everyone's doing it. We start our own business, and that's great. It's often over glorified. I like to kind of give a dose of reality. One thing a mentor of mine in Detroit, who since relocated to Minnesota, told me as I started my business, Rochelle, this will be the hardest thing you ever do. And she was a former business owner. She said, Rochelle, this will be the hardest thing you will ever do. And she said, I laughed at her and said, yeah, right. I've done some pretty hard things. This will be nothing. It's the hardest thing I've ever done, but we encourage you. It's wonderfully rewarding, but it's a lot of work because there are several skills that are required. Again, I had the corporate background, so I was doing my sales role or my marketing role. There was people, other people in the company handling finance and accounting and everything else. As an entrepreneur, either you do it all or you hire people to do it, but you still got to have the understanding to know. Do you know your financial? Do you know your numbers? Can you understand your accounting? Do you understand the operations to make, create systems and processes to make things more efficient? So you've got to be knowledgeable enough to manage other people. Creativity, all of that is, is, goes into entrepreneurship. But let me give you the exciting, the great news. There's eight reasons why now's a good time. The economy's picking up. There's pent-up demand for consumers, crowdfunding such as Kickstarter. So going to the bank, going to Chase Bank and saying, hey, I need a business loan, which is very challenging for startups because they say you have no history, we don't want to loan you money, you're not going to be able to pay it back. You can go to Kickstarter, people can find what you're doing. All right? So just a whole new, unique way of getting things done. Incentives in terms of tax cuts, all right? Small businesses, entrepreneurship in this nation, there's just a whole push for people to start their own businesses. Because while you may think that it's the Fortune 500, that's how I thought, the big companies that are really driving business in this economy know it's really small business. There's loads more start small businesses that are keeping this economy afloat than your large corporations. Number four, resources abound, such as fast track, there's different things to help you get started. I know LSUS, point number five, actually has a small business development center. So there's people, free resources, free tools to help you. Get your business started. Number six, there's lots of freelancers out there that are willing to do contract work because hiring people is expensive. So you get contractors who are willing to do it at a lower rate. Number seven, you can think globally, not local. So you can start a business online and have customers in China ordering from you the next day. So that's totally revolutionized the way small business is done. Number eight, you're needed. Like I said, it's not the Fortune 500s that are driving this economy. It's the small businesses. And we need you if that's an area you want to pursue. I'm going to shift here towards the end with six tenets of success. Number one, confidence, folks. Confidence. We talk about getting, reaching career success or success in any area of life. It's all about confidence. Do you believe in yourself? Do you have an unwavering ability in terms of who you are, what you can do, what you can bring to the table? But there's a difference. Confidence is not arrogant or not entitled. All right? It's all about sincere drive and ambition. And this last point I want to make is that there's, there's one thing, there's one topic I absolutely just speak on just every day of my life to be confident. I'm just so passionate about confidence. Because insecurity in your career and in your life will absolutely derail you. There's people who have been on the job for 20 years and wonder why. They haven't moved. They've been stuck. But if you don't believe that you can move into management, 
you don't show that confidence, if you don't take those risks and prove yourselves to be managerial material, they won't take you seriously. And you'll be on the sidelines of wondering, why is everybody else coming in and getting promoted? All right? So insecurity is a career derailer. Secondarily, leadership. Leadership expert John Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. Huge question that always comes up. Are leaders born or made? All right, and there's folks, there's pros and cons, and experts on either side saying that. All right, but one thing we do know is those folks who have proven themselves to be extraordinary leaders have had a lot of training, have had a lot of mentoring and coaching, and folks and tools and resources to help them along the way. And that's the beauty of LSUS is the opportunities to lead, take opportunities to lead, to learn and grow and develop while you can. And as that last point, while the stakes are smaller. If you want to have an opportunity to leave perhaps your fraternity, sorority, or any other marketing club, great leadership opportunity. As opposed to going, you're all of a sudden now a VP in some situation, you have very little leadership skills and you're managing people and you don't know how to deal with it. So take full advantage of opportunities to learn right now. I love what Robert Schwarma says in the book, The Leader Who Had No Title. Leadership isn't just for CEOs, military generals, and people who govern nations. Leadership is for everyone, each and every one of us in this room. And in the dazzling change in business and society, it really is the single most important discipline required to win. This world is starving, looking for folks to lead, to lead effectively. We can all give examples of core leaders that we've worked with, served with, church, community, whatever the case may be. We have an opportunity to truly transform society and world by being effective leaders. Work ethic, all right? We've got the Louisiana Latin apps, you have to say that in Louisiana. You always want to go above and beyond. Now, we know that the baby boomers and the Xers are saying the millennials come in and they're not willing to pay the price. They want everything handed to them. All right? See some smiles because we've all we've heard that. But this is all about, again, differentiating yourself. How can you show them that you are willing to go the extra mile? How can you give them a dose of that land app that says that you're willing to go the extra mile and give a little extra? Okay? I had a former sales director who used to always tell us, reach to a seat. You think about your goals, you're thinking about what you're doing, your classes, whatever the case may be, reach to a seat. But the status quo and being average is not good. It's not cool. It's not going to get you far. Adaptability, this is something your generation, more so than the two previous, really gets. Remember, you all are open to change. You're willing to transfer and move, and you're open. All of this energy. Okay, it's very important. Being adaptable in your work relationships is so, so, so important. So when you're dealing with the, or you're dealing with the baby boomer, generation X, just remember we all have different perspectives and values. And just be adaptable and be willing to shift and say, oh, I'm dealing with this baby boomer. Bob just really wants to kind of keep things the way they are. I understand that. How can we work together to create a scenario that will be effective for both of us? Next, mentoring. If there is one lesson, that I learned at LSUS that has served me tremendously well is the value of mentors. My first mentors were right there on campus, Dr. Charlene Anthony Barlow, Dr. Linda K. Martin, Dr. Karen James, and several folks here who really took me under their wing and I learned so much from them. All right, there's no need to reinvent the wheel. So when you all are dealing with baby boomers and generation Xers, know, hey, there's folks that are willing to take me under their wing, shorten my learning curve. That's actually my current mentor, Sia. She's actually a director of change management at Northwestern University. Humility is so important, teachable spirit. Millennials are often accused of, kind of quote unquote, knowing it all, gotta have things their way, and this and that. Again, it's a stereotype. You know that's not true, that's why stereotypes can be ineffective. We've got folks with very, very different work ethics and things like that in this room. But for all of us, regardless of generation, we've got to have a teachable spirit. We've gotta be coachable, open to feedback. So when you turn in that English paper and that professor says, hey, you could have done this, be grateful. Be grateful for that kind of feedback. It will help you. Be open to learning. Be willing to admit mistakes. And I love to share this example of me and Ye Jun Hong. She's a current junior at Northwestern University. She's from the Detroit area. And so I interviewed her. I was one of the alumni interviews when she came in to, to apply to the school. She started out as a double major in pre-med and music. She's a flute player. Long story short, that was a tough road. She was in the library, the New York Western Library is over 24 hours. She was there till 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning every night. She had no life, she's not happy, she's miserable. She asked herself that question what am I passionate about? And as opposed to what does everyone want me to do, what am I passionate about? What is my purpose? What are my talents and gifts? All right? She 
She's now in the School of Education and Social Policy. Is so happy. She's joined all of these student groups, loves her life. So guess what, folks? The lesson we can all learn from this millennial is we can't afraid to be wrong. We can't be afraid to be wrong. Okay, if something isn't working, we're not happy. Let's shift gears, baby boomers, Generation Xers. All right, we can't be afraid to be wrong. We've got to have the humility, humility to admit that, change directions. As I close here, I want to talk a little bit about the LSU, LSUS advantage. Again, as I'm coming back on campus, I've been reflecting, thinking, okay, it's been a long time since I've been a student here. What, what has really kind of been my overall experience as I think about my time here on campus? Why LSUS? And this is all schools, all colleges in the area are wonderful, but I'm a graduate of LSUS. So I've got these points to say. When I think about my perspective, um, this is actually a picture from 1998. You'll see the lady with her back turned, one of my mentors, was my major PR professor, Dr. Linda Martin. On the other side of her is Dr. Karen James, who's actually in the audience today. And when I think about my LSUS experience, when I think about, again, I've attended two graduate programs after I left here. No other class, like Karen James' class, prepared me for grad school. The intensity of the work, her passion for teaching and learning, was really so beneficial. And I coupled that with a foster, it helped the LSUS foster the love of learning. I used to sit on the front row just, just eating up everything my professor said. Supporting faculty and staff. We've got wonderful folks who truly care about their people. And working with Asia Martin, working with Dr. Tammy Knox, we're excited about getting this opportunity together. They want the best for you students. They want to create an awesome experience. So I see that that continues. Lastly, numerous opportunities to get involved. Folks, if you're in a university with 50 or 60,000 students, your opportunities to stand out and to lead and gain the experience and grow are going to be limited. That's why a school like LSU is a perfect size. LSUS, to learn and to grow and to move forward. I love to share this story, particularly here at LSUS. Nick Kraps and I were both student orientation or SOAR leaders, student orientation registration leaders. We worked in the student law office, I mean the registrar's office. This is Nick and I. He's both 37. That's his family. She's a College of Education LSUS grad in 1999 as well. At 37 years old, Nick is a chief executive officer of a hospital in Houston, Texas. So he is leading in that role with other CEOs across the nation who are in their 50s and 60s. He's achieved that in his 30s. And what does he have to say? Undergrad, keep that in mind, LSUS, was such a formative time in my life. I cannot imagine being where I am had I gone anywhere else. It was so easy to get involved and learn from the numerous leadership opportunities that presented themselves, not to mention the great professors. So we actually had a reunion here at the Lions of Bossier City as he and his family live in Houston. But think about it, folks. He says without LSUS, he wouldn't be a CEO today. So for those of you who want to be CEOs and start your own companies and run organizations, you have the opportunity to learn what it takes here. From an alumni perspective, again, we talked about what I think is a student. From an alumni perspective, it has been absolutely awesome. I know Diane Howes in the audience. She's a one woman alumni machine. So not only do we get support, did we get support as students, but I know as alums, she has been a fantastic resource for me coming back. So no, not only are you getting a good experience as a student, but you will as an alum as well. So this all works together for success. To summarize, embrace the differences of others, different generations, boomers, Xers, millennials, even the Zs who are coming after you. Leadership opportunities, you've got to leverage those. This is a good opportunity for you to lead. Your career success is up to you. Again, nobody owes any of us anything. We've got to work hard. We've got to sacrifice and do what it takes to make it happen. Develop your personal brand. Remember. The workplace already has this preconceived notion that you all just want to pay, don't want to give, don't want to sacrifice, you already know it's take everything for granted. That's not the truth. Okay, but it's up to you to prove that. All right, because we know we've got some, some rock stars in this room, but the world needs to know it, and you have a job to do to prove that. Okay? Balance your short term goals with long term goals. Think about the long term effects of what you're doing in terms of the community and giving back. And as I started with picturing it, the power of belief and how Dr. Panther Ball encouraged me to keep going, I also want to close with this final note here, the power of belief and recognizing it. When I think about LSUS and the college years and my time spent in this area, obviously lived up north for a long time now, it's been almost 15 years. Thinking about the power of belief, it's also been wonderful people in the community, but also I wouldn't be where I am today without my parents. When you think about the power of belief in the people around you, your parents are those who will truly, no 
matter what you're going through, support you, encourage you. And I'm so grateful for my parents. And I'm thankful for this opportunity.